Leviticus 20, 7 through 8. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God, and you shall keep my statutes on word and perform them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. And then the next one, 1 Corinthians 1, 2 says, To the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. And so last week I laid a foundation of what it means to be sanctified, what it means to be set apart. Um, and, and so uh, when, it come, when we come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, God declares us righteous and he declares us holy. Um, and it's not just to declare us that, but it's also that we would begin to walk a holy lifestyle out. Scripture says, be holy because I, God, is, am holy. And so not only are we positionally right in a right relationship with, with uh, a God as, as holy and righteous, but now he's saying, now walk, now I've, now I've called you and I've made you holy, now walk a holy life out. And so, and then we also... Uh, talked about how God makes us holy and he sets us apart for service to him. Okay? And so there's a purpose behind why he's doing what he's doing. And then we also looked at that uh, sanctification is a process. When, when we come to Christ, yes, we're in a right relationship with him. We're in right standing with him. We are holy in Christ Jesus. But how many of us will say that I, I didn't immediately begin to act holy at that time? Okay? And we could probably say in this room, honestly, today, across the room, from the youngest to the oldest, that even though we've been Christians for maybe a year or even decades or half a century, that we're still not holy like God is. Right. And so sanctification is a process where God's beginning to create in us more and more of his character day in and day out. Yeah. And it's a process. It doesn't happen instantly. Okay? So we lay that foundation um, uh, last week and today what I want to do is I want to begin to talk about why are we set apart okay and we're just going to go through two things today um, I'm going to build on this next week as well um, but we're set apart for a reason and that first one is this we are set apart to live a godly lifestyle we are set apart to live a godly lifestyle what is a godly lifestyle is behavior reflecting correct religious beliefs and attitudes it's simply to live as God has told us we should live according to his word. And this is what I love about God. He tells us what pleases him. It's no mystery. It's no secret. He tells us in his word. And as we get into it, we begin to understand what he's looking for out of his sons and daughters. And if you're here today as a son and daughter of God, God is actually calling us to a higher place of living. He, he didn't call us out of darkness to keep us walking in darkness. He called us out of darkness to walk as light in this world. And with, with today's Christianity in, in, in America, I, I mean, if, if, if your eyes are open, you can see a lot of compromise in Christians. They're walking in darkness. And God hasn't called Christians to continue to walk in darkness. Now, yes, again, sanctification is a process. And yes, we blow it. We miss the mark. We sin. Um, that's going to happen. But thank God for his grace and his mercy that when, when we, we turn back to him and we repent and say, Lord, I blew it. I sinned against you. Forgive me. I wasn't modeling you. I was modeling my flesh. God forgives us. We the slate. And now we get to begin that journey again and, and walking that out. Um, and so his word directs us how we, how we should live. Which means we need to get anything out of our life that contradicts his character. Did you hear that? We need to begin to get rid of everything in our life that contradicts his character. Yeah. And just a little bit of an encouragement here. You're not going to be able to do it in your own strength to do that. Come because on. your flesh likes fleshly things. Yeah. Come on, just like women like chocolate. The flesh likes fleshly things. And because the flesh likes fleshly things, it's going to want to hang on. Yeah. Like a bad cold. It's going to want to keep pestering you and bothering you in that area that is a weakness in you. But we got a purpose to call upon God's grace to begin to saturate that area of our life and allow his grace to do its work in us as we just humbly submit ourselves to that grace and the working of his word and his spirit in our life. Are you with me today? Yes. 
So 1 Timothy 6.11 says this, but you, Timothy, so this is what I want you to do right now. I want you to fill your name in there. Okay? For you, Deirdre, are a man or a woman <laughs> of God. So run, so run from all these evil things. Pursue righteousness and a godly life. Along with faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Now, just, just a, a little background on that scripture. If you read verses above that, like the, like, what do we got? Nine verses above that. Uh, if you read those, you'll begin to see that, that Paul is talking to Timothy about greed, about people pursuing greed, about people pursuing money uh, for worldly gain. Um, and he, he's telling him when he says, flee from these evil things, he's referencing to that. But I want to also put this in there. We're to flee through from any evil thing. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean that we're to flee from people doing evil things. Okay, Let's make that very clear. But in our life, if there's things that aren't pleasing to God, we've got to begin to flee from them. Okay? And then we're fleeing not just for the sake of running and getting away. We're, we're, we're fleeing not just for the sake of, of saying, see you later. We're fleeing for the purpose of pursuing something. Right. Okay? We're pursuing something else. And that is righteousness and a godly life. Along with faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Because as, a, as we live out a godly life, we're going to need faith. We're going to need love for one another. We're going to need the love of God in our lives. We're going to need perseverance and endurance. And we're also going to need to be gentle. Okay? Look at uh, what, what uh, Titus says in 2.12. He says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly righteously and godly in the present age. So what's, what's this verse talking about? Paul's actually defining for our for the church today and the church back then was simply defining what grace is. And grace teaches us something. True grace teaches us something. And it's this, that we're to den deny ungodliness and worldly lust. Are you hearing me today? Yes. We're to deny those things. And again, it's not in our strength to do it. It's in God's strength to do right. it. Okay? So we're to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. And again, we're supposed to replace it with sober living. What is sober living? It simply means being sensible and moderate in one's behavior. Okay? And then we're to live righteously and godly. And we're supposed to live righteously and godly when we get to heaven. No, in this present age, today, tomorrow, next month, next year, next decade, Amen. next century, yeah. till you die. Okay? We're to live like that now. It's not just for heaven, it's for now. Isn't that awesome that we have the power of the Holy Spirit in us to live a righteous godliness, a godly lifestyle now? And when we do that, it pleases the Lord. Yeah. But we got to remember that living according to how God wants us to live is not based on how others in the world is living. And it's not based on how other Christians are living. It's based on and solely upon the Word of God. And what the Word of God declares is that He wants His children to be living and how they would be living. Titus 1.1 says this. This letter is from Paul, a slave of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I have been sent to proclaim faith to those God has chosen and to teach them to know the truth that shows them how to live godly lives. You know, preaching should end up causing our lives to change. It should. When you hear whoever's up here on Sunday morning, which probably 90% of the time it's me and then there's other people that are up here in the church speaking, um, when you hear the word being preached, if you will take that word and begin to apply it to your life, I, I'm going to tell you right now, you'll begin to walk a godly life out. Right. When you sit and begin to meditate on it and think about it and talk about it with yourself during the week, what was preached, it's going to begin to get into your life and it's going to begin to change your life. Yeah. And, and come on. Amen. But if we sit here and just go, dear God, when is he going to be done? I only come for the worship. You're missing the whole point of the service. It's to come in and encounter with the radical God who wants to touch us. And yes, it is a time 
to worship him and to lift him up and to magnify him, his name. Yes, it's a time for the gifts to move with, with the, within the body to exhort and to encourage. And yes, it is a time for the word to be preached so that word can penetrate your heart and your soul and that change can begin to take place in your life and that you can begin to live a godly life. That's church. And Paul purpose was to begin to show the churches that he, he built and that he was writing to that we should be living a godly life. And I want to just say this really quick. If you go back and you study the climate and the culture of Paul's day, it was a lot like it is today. I would venture to say that in some degrees it was worse because the stuff that was going on in, in the temples that were there that were attracting Christians and, and the like was not good. It's, it's more deplorable than what we see going on in, in, in our world today. So I could make an argument that there's some things that were worse back then. There's some things we're dealing with today that probably they didn't deal with a whole lot, but they had other things they were dealing with. But don't think that we live in the worst time of society or in the world and go, well, it's just too hard. No, Paul was addressing everything we see today in the world, in the church, and in the world back then. It says this in 1 Timothy um, 6.3. It says, Some people may contradict our teaching, but these are the wholesome teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. These teachings promote godly life. These teachings promote godly life. So, what do we get from this? I believe the true gospel, when it's preached, and the true word of God, when it's preached, will produce a godly life and godly living. Because it's the word of God. And it's meant to change lives. It's, me, it's meant to break chains. Amen? Amen? I believe that when the true gospel uh, begins, or the true word of God begins to preach, ungodly, ungodly living becomes godly living. It happens. And I believe what Paul saw in his day is a foreshadow of what we even see today. We see today that there's people preaching the word of God, but it's not ever bringing any change to their congregation. Because I believe they're preaching another gospel that is a gospel that God loves them and God doesn't call you to change. That you can stay the same and it's okay with God. And don't get me wrong, God is a loving God. There's no doubt about that. God is a loving God. But when he put, places his spirit in a human body, he places it in there for the purpose of changing and representing him in this world. 1 Timothy 4.8 says this, Physical training is good, but training for godly, godliness is much better. Yeah. Prom, uh, is much better promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. Now, let me ask you, how many of you, uh, for your New Year's resolution, has got back in the gym and you're doing some physical training? Anybody in here doing that? I know I'm kind of doing it, although I start a little bit early. But anyways. So, so many times this time of the year, and, and Derek working at the Y knows there's an influx of people that join the Y. There's a wave of people that come in and join the way. The why, and about two months later, that wave trickled out. Came in, trickled out. Because they realized physical training is not easy. Getting your body into shape is not easy. Uh, been there, done that. Um, I actually have a yacht that sailed so many times back in and out, back in and out, back in and out. Um, but listen, don't, don't, don't get me wrong. We need to take care of our bodies. Because our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. We need to do our best to feed it, nourish it, take care of it, exercise, all those things that we need to do, we should do. Okay? I, I get it. Uh, but as good as physical training is, it doesn't compare to spiritual training. It doesn't compare to training for godliness. Listen, physical training has benefits, but those benefits are only in this lifetime. Godly training is eternal. It's not only going to give us benefits in this life, but it's going to give us benefits in the life to come. Yeah. Listen very closely. When we live a godly lifestyle, we make better choices. Right. We make right. better decisions. When we're living a life that's not pleasing to God, we make bad, bad choices, poor choices, bad decisions, and we have to reap and live out consequences of those. It's a funny thing. I can look back at my life and see when I was going all out for God, I always seemed to have made better choices. And I didn't have consequences that I had to live with. But I could also look back and go, when I was not serving the Lord, 
sorry, pastor has been there. He didn't grow up, come, he wasn't born in the church and grew up and was perfect all his life. No, I'm a human and I made a lot of mistakes. And I still make mistakes. But you know what? I'm sorry, it's true, I do. Ask my wife. She'll throw me on the bus as quick as... <laughs> she'll throw me on the bus as quick as instant pudding. <laughs> but when we make good choices, we don't have the consequences that plague us the rest of our life. There's benefits in this lifetime of living a godly life. God's going to bless it. God's going to honor it. And the choices that we make are going to be choices that are going to be fruitful instead of dragging us down. Is that okay to say on Sunday morning? Yeah. Hey, listen, every day we're faced with choices. Every day we're faced with decisions. And how we choose dictates what our future is going to look like. That's right. That's true. And unfortunately, if we choose wrong or, or we're not seeking the Lord or His Word, we're going to make choices that are going to lead us down roads that we're not going to like. Mm -hmm. And I think God, out of His mercy, lets us go down those roads. Hopefully, that we'll come to a place of going, Lord, I blew it, so we don't make mistakes like that again. Yeah. But we all know some people who continue to go around the mountain over and over and over and over again, and they just never seem to do something different. And they're always going through difficulty in their life. And it's not one thing, it's another thing, and stuff starts piling up, and then they're, they're heaped up in their own pile of results of bad choices and decisions. And yet God can do this in a moment. When we turn to him, we, we, we repent and ask him to forgive us for doing things his own way. He can change things around. And one thing I love about God is no matter what bad choices we made, no matter what circumstances we may have to live with, God can turn it around and bring a ministry and a testimony out of it. Because yeah. right. that's God. But he'll sure let us make the bad choices oh, yeah. and the bad decisions and let the consequences come. But he's always there ready to turn it around and make a ministry and a testimony out of it. That's our God. It's not the end of the world. Our circumstances may not disappear, but he'll give you grace to walk out. He'll give you grace to walk it out. Maurice Roberts says this, If society is to be awakened one day from its deep slumber, it will only be done by Christians who have first woken up themselves to the full splendor of their privilege and who have taken seriously the call to live wholly and entirely for God. Think about that for just a moment. That if the church would wake up and begin to take seriously the Word of God and take seriously beginning to live the Word of God, that that would wake up society. I, I believe that society is begging to see the church rise up Amen. and be the church. Yeah. I think society is tired of the church and the games and the scandals and Everything that's been going on for the last 30 years. I think they're tired of it. I think we're a bunch of, they, I think they think we're a bunch of hypocrites. And you know what? I would have to agree. I've been there myself. And I would venture to agree, I would venture to think that all of us in this room have been there once upon a time in our life. Listen, we know how to play church. But we don't live church six days a week or seven days a week. We typically live church one day a week. What happens in our home? And again, I've been to, I've done children's ministry. I hear what kids are talking about that goes on in the home. Yeah. And a lot of kids experience ungodly living within the family dynamic that messes them up. Mm -hmm. But then there's the ability to put on the face on Sunday morning and look like everything's all together. There's marriages that are a wreck at home during the week, but it looks perfect on Sunday morning. These things society sees. They see us at work and how we treat our, our, our co-employees. They see it all. And they think to themselves, Christians are hypocrites. I want nothing to do with them. And so I believe when the church rises up and takes honest takes honesty to living holy and entirely unto God, that will begin to wake up a nation. Yeah. That will begin to, to show them that, hey, the church is getting it together. Because believe it or not, I believe the church has a better idea of what a Christian should look like than a lot of Christians understand they should look like. Yeah. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. I believe my wife's confused, so I'll help here, hopefully. 
I believe the world understands what a Christian should look like better than most Christians understand they should look like. All right, number two. We are set apart to be salt, light, and fragrance to the world. Uh, Matthew, 5, or Matthew 5, 13 through 16 says this. You are the salt of the earth. We're all familiar with this. If you've been in church for a while, you know this verse. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your Heavenly Father. So just briefly about this. How many How many like to season with salt in here? You really like to season with salt? Um, I think I've said this before. My dad grew up. Uh, uh, was in the Navy for 22 years, I believe it was, and I think salt was the common seasoning. And so when he got out, he salted a lot of things, a lot. At times I thought it's, it snowed on his salad, there was so much salt on there. Uh, but salt adds flavor. Salt adds flavor. Uh, and our lives are to add flavor to the world. It's to add flavor to the world. Why is that? It's, it's because Jesus added flavor to the world. Right. Listen, when Jesus walked this earth, he added flavor to the world. He made the world a better place. He changed the world for the better. Right. And so God's calling us to be salt. He's calling us to add flavor to the world. Right. Not a sour flavor. Not those Sour Patch Kids. Not those, what are those things that are like little Warhead. golf stoppers and they like Warheads. Warheads, yeah. Yeah, they're they're good, but man, that's not a good good thing for Christians to be like warheads, huh? Yeah. Even a bad flavor and a bad taste in people's mouths. Okay? He calls us to, to, to shine our light. God wants to shine his light through us. Okay? Remember, our body is a temple of his Holy Spirit. And he wants to shine his light through us. God doesn't want us to keep his light under wraps. Amen. And you know what? When we're embarrassed to say that we're a Christian, when we're embarrassed to say that we're a Christian, we just put a basket over our light. There's no reason in the world today to be embarrassed that we're Christians. There's no reason. If, if, if you get persecuted for, for being a Christian, rejoice. You're in good company. If you, get in, if you get in trouble for saying you're a Christian, great. You're in good company. Trust God to take care of you. But we can't hide the fact that we have the glorious spirit of God in us that's desiring to shine out of us to then put a basket over us and hide it. Because God's meaning to reveal himself through us, which is crazy. It's crazy to think that a holy God wants to reveal his glory through us. But he does. And he's chosen us to do that. And yes, so many times we put that basket over and we hold that light in. But I'll, I'll, I'm believing for myself and I'm believing for this church that we'll get rid of the basket once and for all. Yeah, and just let the light shine. Just let it flow out of us. Come on. Yeah. God wants to do great things. And the glory of his light is this. The more he changes, changes us, the more that light shines. The more confident we have, the more abilities we have. Just it makes everything better. The, the more we get ourselves on the altar, allow him to do his work in us, the greater that light's going to be shining out of us. I was thinking about light. How how could I illustrate light? And I'm not the greatest person coming up with illustrations. I was thinking this morning, oh Lord, I need something for, for light. And this is what I I, I felt planted in my heart. I, I, how many of you have seen sunrises recently? Sure. And we've had some pretty beautiful sunrises. If you miss them, go to Facebook. Ted has taken some of Margie has posted them and, and stuff. And honey, am I running you off? No. Your mic's about oh, I got a red light. Let me stop. 
But I was thinking about a sunrise and how a sunrise is a gradual thing that begins to happen. We don't go from pitch darkness to all of a sudden noonday light. So as I was saying, when, when a sunrise begins to happen, it's not like just a beam of light that all of a sudden appears. It's a gradual thing as the sun begins to rise, rise up. It's gradual. And as it rises up, it starts out and it begins to displace darkness ever so much. And then as it gets higher um, in, in the horizon, it begins to get brighter and brighter and brighter until the new day, day light, right? Yeah. I believe when we live our life in a gentle light, I believe it does more society. Amen. I believe it attracts more people. Because yeah. I was thinking about this as well. How many of you live, have lived out in the country once upon a time in your life or currently? We used to live in Seabeck and Seabeck doesn't have street lights or anything like that. And, and so it's pitch black out there at nighttime. And so you got, you're driving a lot of times if there's no cars coming, you're driving with high beams on and you shut those babies down when a car's coming. But I don't know how many times I had people leave their high beams on, and it's obnoxious. I mean, it's blinding. It's like you want to drive that car into the ditch as quick as you can possibly do it. But So, you, you know, you're trained to kind of look to the white line, but still you're getting blinded by it. And it's obnoxious. And I think sometimes we try to shine our light in our flesh, and it becomes obnoxious to people. Instead of being humble and gentle, to allow the light of God to shine. Because that's what Jesus did. Jesus was humble and gentle. The only time he had issues, the only time he's, he said things like brutal and things like that, was when he was addressing people in what would be the church. Right. It was the Pharisees. It was the religious leaders who he was addressing that way. Right. But when it came to other people that were outside of the church, when, he, when it came to other people that he encountered, he was gentle with them. Right. He was yeah. warm with them. He wasn't judgmental. He wasn't critical. He was that. He he was like a warm. He was like a sun a, a sunrise, gentle. He wasn't high beams flashing in their eyes, blinding them. He was he was bringing life to them. And I think so many times we try to do so much in our own strength that we actually offend people because it's not a God thing. It's not God just naturally flowing out of us. It's us trying to make something happen. Right. And I was thinking, you know, it, we finally had a cold morning today, in a long time, frost on the, the windows and stuff. And, you know, there's nothing like an early sunrise where it's cold out, a winter, and that sun begins to rise up and those rays begin to start displacing the darkness. But when those rays begin to hit your face, you can feel the warmth of that. That's what I want to see in a church. A church that shines its light. A, a church that's not bashful about it, but does it in such a way that it warms people's lives up. Right. Instead of repels them and causes them to go, oh, get away. Yeah. Shut up. Turn it off. What's your problem? Kind of a thing. Are you with me this morning? Yeah. Come on. God wants to do so much in this community. And he's going to do it through us. Yeah. So good things we should... The good thing, and then he said that when you do good things, let it be seen for all, so they can worship God or glorify God. Listen, when we do good things, it should never be about us. Right, it should never be about us, because the purpose of doing good things is to just simply share the love of God, meet a need, whatever God places on your heart. But it's not about us going, oh, look what they did for me. It's, it's not even for them. We should be real quick to deflect as they say thank you. We should begin to deflect that onto Jesus. Yeah. Jesus is the reason why. Yeah. Jesus is the reason why I did this. Because Jesus loves you. Yeah. I, I uh, was uh, kind of ministering to a young man at church this, or at, at the Y this week. And Monday, I was going in to play pickleball. And he was coming out. He was just finished up with basketball. And he had gotten a rebound, and he had turned like this while somebody was there with their thumb out. Oh. And it literally went all the way into the socket uh. field. And it, watch this. It shifted the eye oh. towards the nose. Gross. And there's blood coming out of it. There's, they actually had to get the hazmat group, group in there at the Y to clean up the blood that was all over the floor. And so that happened on Monday. I saw him on Tuesday, and I, I asked him, hey, how's your eye doing today? And he's nervous. 
I mean, he's afraid. He's coming across to me like he's afraid that he's going to lose his eyesight. And so we were talking about that for a little bit. And I just I looked at him and I said, hey, you pray, I'll pray. And we'll let God do something. So then I, then I saw him the, the next day on, on Thursday. I'm headed out. He's headed in. I'm yelling across the little entryway there. Hey, how's your eye doing today? And he's like, it's better. Yeah. Like, is it 100% better? And he goes, not yet, but it's better. And I'm like going, I'm going to keep praying until it's 100%. Right? So then I saw him, I think, I think maybe Friday or something like that. So I stopped to ask him, how's your eye doing? And this, this, you know, this is just where he's at. And this is what I did with him. He goes, man, they, speaking about the specialist in Seattle, because he had to go to Harvard to do a specialist to get his eye taken care of. They did a really good job. And I said, no, God's doing a good job. Because yeah. I want him to know I'm deflecting everything to God. Because, yes, God gives people talents and abilities, mm -hmm. but it ultimately is God that brings the whole healing. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm believing with him. I even shared with him that first Tuesday. I even went back to them after, after doing some sit-ups. Yeah, I know it doesn't look like it, but yeah, let's do some sit-ups. Um, but I went back to him and I said, hey, I just want to encourage you with something. When, I, when we were in India, we were praying for people who who were losing their eyesight and their hearing, and God healed them. I was there, saw it with my own eyes. And I want you to know, what God will do for one, he will do for you. Yeah. What they needed deliverance from and healing from, God met them there, and God will do the same for you. Yep. It's all about God. It's all about lifting God up. It's all about magnifying yeah. him. Yeah. My gosh. Sorry. <clears throat> so, Everything's about God. Everything we should do is all about God. Right. 2 Corinthians 2.15 says this, we, For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. So let's make no doubt this morning that we are a fragrance to God. And we're to be the fragrance of Jesus to God. We are to smell less and less of ourselves, church. <laughs> Less and less of yourself. We need to smell less and less and, and smell more and more of him. But listen, we're also a fragrance to one another in the church. And we're also a fragrance to those outside the church. Right. What is your fragrance that you're putting off in the body of Christ? Is it unity? Is it love? Is it mercy? Is it grace? Is it forgiveness? Or is it division? Is it uh, unforgiveness? Is it strife? Is it envy? Is it jealousy? Is it backbiting? What is the fragrance you're putting off in the church today? Because listen, we're all putting something off. And my prayer is that we can take a group of people with God's anointing and begin to have a great fragrance in this place. And I believe there's, there's areas that we as a, as a whole have a great fragrance to. I hear what new people say when they come visit the church. Okay? But I also hear some of the problems that are going on in the church. Which, that's family. You're going to have issues and stuff like that. But if we can all commit, commit to unity and, and working through, this church is going to have an aroma that's going to attract people. Amen. 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 <coughs> but what are we leaving a fragrance to those who are not saved? What fragrance are we leaving to them? Those that are perishing, what are we speaking? What are we saying to them about God? by the way we live our life, the way we treat people. What are we saying? Because we're saying something, and it's putting off a smell or, or a nice aroma. Are we judgmental towards the lost? Are we prideful towards the lost? Do we come across as a holier-than-thou towards the lost? Because I'm telling you, they don't want that anymore. They want real-life Christianity. Right. Who's willing to admit, you know what, I made mistakes, I still make mistakes, but God still loves me. God hasn't given up on me, and he won't give up on you either. But what, what's the fragrance? What are we speaking? What are we putting off when we're out in the world? John 12, 3 says this, Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Now when Mary came into this situation, she was coming in very humbly. She had acknowledged and she knew that she was a sinner, and that she needed what Jesus had. 
And she came and she laid it all on the line. A year's worth of salary to break open that fragrance and to, to pour it on Jesus and to wash his, his feet with her hair. And yet that fragrance filled the entire room. And I believe that fragrance was so small, so strong that when the disciples left, that fragrance went with them. So what kind of fragrance are we leaving? It's interesting. It says, it says the, the, the whole house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Now, I want, to, I want to draw your attention to that word oil. Oil in the Bible is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit in us. We have the fragrance of God in us, church. Amen. And that fragrance, just like that light, wants to get out. That fragrance, just like that light, wants to permeate other people's lives. It wants to make a difference in the world. And so we're set apart not to, not to put off the fragrance of our old sinful lifestyle, but to put off the fragrance of Jesus. Come on. You know, uh, Deirdre and I went to uh, Salish Lodge for our 26th wedding anniversary back in, in December. And it was a little bit stressful getting there because traffic was bad and we were running a little bit late. And, uh, but we ended up finally getting there pretty close, but it was get your, get your luggage in, get out of your clothes because we had a double, a couple's uh, massage. In, in, in the, yeah, double's massage. Uh, but uh, so we're, we're rushing to get to our appointment for that because if you're late you just lose time on your massage and when you're paying money to get the massage you want every moment of it right I mean this is professional this isn't your wife or your husband it, it is professional and so when we walked into that spa area the fragrance in that place was phenomenal it took away the stress of getting there on time, it took away everything, and it kind of put up. All right, this is awesome. I feel good. It, it just the fragrance changed demeanor, it changed attitude, it just changed life, and it was so good that when we went back to the room, <laughs> what, kind of, what kind of show is this? When we went back to the room, the shampoo smelled like it, the conditioner smelled like it, the lotion smelled like it, the oils that they had for the spa, smelled, it smelled just awesome the whole time we were there. What is this? Have you ever been to see this watch? Go, you don't have to stay there, just walk into the, to the place and we'll smell the pillow. And, and I think, I think I was asking her, hey, what was that smell? But I think part of it is like eucalyptus and other, other things. And it's like, oh, it's just, I wish I could bottle that and put it in my car. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes you can just never get a fragrance that smells good to put in your car. You know, even if you get like new car smell, it doesn't smell like new car. Mm -hmm. But oh, it's so good. They should bottle it. But then there's a bad fragrance. Maybe you can relate with this if you're in the gym. <laughs> I, I'm not kidding and I'm not trying to put anybody down but sometimes you walk in, in how many remember like uh, what was it like Snoopy was it Pink, Pink Pin that always had the little lines that were signifying that he stunk well it's almost like that invisible line that you walk through and you go oh my gosh has that person not put deodorant on for days and it's a bad I mean I'm telling you it's so bad it leaves a taste in your mouth Anybody experience that in the, in the okay, I'm, I'm not alone. Thank you. Thank you. No Listerine pocket pack will take care of that taste in your mouth. But it's a bad aroma. And it's like, can you not smell that? And they're probably going, man, someone's got really bad, bad deal. It's like, no, you got bad deal. Lift up your arm. Take a turn to the right. Smell. It's you. But they're clueless. But is that the church sometimes? Is that us in our workplace, in our school, in our activities that we do with people? Is that us? Do we put off the stench like that where people want nothing to do with us? Or are we putting off a fragrance that's like we change the atmosphere of where we go? Come on, God has set us apart to change the atmosphere. God has set us apart to cause us to be a fragrance that will people will be delighted to be around us. And not, oh dear God, here they come block away. 
You know, I grew up in a, in a home where my dad smoked a lot. And to this day, I am ultra sensitive to cigarette smoke. Ultra sensitive. Like, I can smell it a block away. And I'll start. She used to think for the longest time I was faking it. It was like, no, I'm not faking it. And then she had a friend that had the same issue that was like, we're like, <laughs> it's bad. Cigarette smoke has become such a repulsive smell to me. Now, obviously, if a non-believer comes around smoking a cigarette, I'm going to have to deal with that. And I'm okay with that. I just, somebody the other day, I was walking somewhere, and you could tell that they were a heavy smoker because it was, their body was just oozing yeah. cigarette smoke. I think when they opened up their jacket, there was actually like a puff of cigarette smoke that came out. <laughs> but, but what kind of fragrance are we putting off in our workplace? Is it drawing people to God, or is it repelling people to God, or away from God? And so I ask you these things. I ask you, I ask myself this thing today. God has set us apart for a reason. It's to live a godly life, and it's to be a fragrance and salt and light to the world. And so what I encourage you to do this week is begin to take a look at your life, and look how you're living it away from church, look at how you're living it at work, and begin to ask the Lord, Lord, am I a good fragrance, or am I a bad fragrance? Am I salt or am I light? Am I living a godly life? And then allow his Holy Spirit to do the work that he wants to do in you so you can be more like him. Right. Amen?